to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song and sung by flaming tongues above praise thy mountain fixed upon it mount of thy redeeming love here i raise my ebenezer hither by thy help i'm come and i hope by thy good pleasure Safely to arrive at home Jesus sorts me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God He to rescue me from danger Interposed His precious blood a fetter binds my wandering heart to thee prone to wander Lord I feel it prone to leave the God I love here's my heart Lord take and seal it seal it for thy courts above Surely the Lord is coming soon. Amen. Amen. Come, Come, Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Let us pray together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, God to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets, secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, Lord have, have mercy, mercy on us and, and write all these laws in our hearts. hearts. And now let us pray together the collect for Advent 1. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light, now in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal, through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and my brother Sothenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ 
was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain, sustain you to the end, guiltless of the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the gospel is Mark chapter 13, beginning at verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you don't, do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake, therefore stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this is the first Sunday of Advent. It's the first day of the church calendar as well. And uh, as you know, that uh, Advent Sundays are are well-themed. Uh, the first Sunday is hope, and then we have uh, peace and joy, and then love, uh, the final Sunday of Advent. But this Sunday is, is the Sunday of hope. But I want to talk to you this morning about grace, because grace points to hope. If we don't have grace, then we can't have any hope. And I'll explain that in, in just a moment. Grace is somewhat of a difficult concept for me, and it may be for you as well, getting something for nothing, if you will. Um, our whole social structure is set up on merit and, and earning of points. The better the grades, the better the job, the better the job, the better the pay. You, you know, you work harder, you get more pay, you get more pay, you get more status, you get more status, you get more respect, you get more respect, you get more power. And there's just this whole wheel turning of just kind of on this hamster wheel and and we're constantly running this race for for merit or to get people to like us or to earn more money to feel accepted in the world based on the things that we have or the things that we do and maybe for you it's that way with your faith as well because i know it can be that way for me sometimes where where sometimes i think well i'm just not doing enough for jesus i'm just not working hard enough i i missed that i i should have said this then i should have done that then oh gosh my what have i what have i done have i truly upset god in not doing this or in saying this or in saying that but thank god for grace and for hope. And one of the reasons why this came up in, 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 in my heart is as I was reading this text earlier this week, I read the opening statement and the way Paul in verse 2 describes the, the Corinthian church. We're looking at 1 Corinthians here, our reading from today, uh, verses uh, 1 to 9 is what we're read. We're gonna, really going to focus in on verse 4 and just kind of build out from there. But in verse 2, Paul has this description of the church, and you would think that even the description itself is 
unmerited. See, the church in Corinth was was an absolute mess. They were full of sinners. They were making mistakes all over the place. They were, they, they were incestuous. There were prostitution. There was lawsuits. There was broken marriages. There was idolatry, sexual misconduct. Their worship was chaotic. There were even some in the church that were denying the resurrection of Jesus. So this church was very much caught up in their sin, very much still caught up in their sin. And so here they were, this church, and here's how Paul addresses this particular church and these particular people. And the rest of, of, of Corinthians, the whole First Corinthians letter, addresses these issues that I just mentioned. And yet here's how Paul begins, and here's how Paul describes the church, this particular church, in verse number two. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. So I read that and I thought, where does Paul get this from this kind of church? I mean, we're reading about, we read on about all the difficulties, all, all of the sin that's that, that's enveloped in this church. Where does Paul get this? get this idea that they're sanctified. Listen to how he describes them, that, that this church, this group of people, this group of believers are still a church of God. They still belong to God despite their mess. They are sanctified. They're still set apart in Christ Jesus despite their mess. They're called to be saints together. In fact, they're saints with all the other saints. They're members of, of all the other churches, still members of the faith, regardless of their deep sinfulness. Where does Paul get that idea from? How can Paul possibly use those words to describe such a sinful people? And we find our answer in verse number four and the topic of the sermon this morning. And the answer, quite simply, is grace. So let's read that in verse four. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Jesus. And we'll stop there, and that's what we'll focus on for now. So Paul is giving thanks to his God. So you see, he's included himself now. He's included himself. He's your God. You're the church of God. He's my God. I'm a part of you. He says, I give thanks to my God always for you, not because of your sinful nature, not because of the fact that you're messed, not because of the fact that you're missing the mark in terms of the faith, not because of the fact that if anyone outside the church looks at you, all they would see was a secular culture, not, not, not a church, not a sanctified church. Despite all of that, right, Paul says that the grace of God is given to you in Christ Jesus. So the grace is given. And that's the first point I want to make, is that the grace is a gift. Whose grace is it? It's God's grace. Did you notice that? The grace of God is given. It is a gift. That's what grace is all about. The Hebrews, actually, all over the Old Testament, uh, they they use that word quite often for grace. The Hebrew word is chen, and it's it's very nuanced, but it means an unmerited favor. So it means an unmerited favor. So a gift that is undeserved. So grace is a gift that is undeserved. But in the Hebrew context of that word, there's more going on there. That It's not just simply a gift that is given to the undeserved, but it is also a delight for the giver to give the gift. Does that make sense? So when Esther asked the Persian king to spare her people, she asked for chen. She asked for an unmerited favor from the king. And the king was delighted to give it to her. When Jacob came back after 20 years after cheating Esau, he came back and he asked Esau for chen. He wanted unmerited favor from Esau, and it was Esau's pleasure and delight to give it to him. And so in the same way, it is a pleasure and a delight for God to give you his grace, to give you his unmerited favor. And it's unmerited because of our sinfulness. Right? So if you look at the Corinth church, they're unmerited, and yet they still receive the grace of God. 
Now notice as well that the grace of God is not just a gift, but it's a person. Back to verse 4, look at what it says. Of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. Now did you notice that Paul doesn't say by Christ Jesus or through Christ Jesus? Christ Jesus didn't, didn't come. He wasn't born Christmas Day to bring you a gift. He was born Christmas Day because he is the gift. You see, the gift, the unmerited gift that we are receiving from God is God himself. It is God incarnate, this babe in a manger who will grow, and at 30 years of age, 32, 33 years of age, he will die on a cross. Why? In order to earn merit on our behalf. And so the gift and the grace, even grace we can say, is the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the grace of God. And we receive the grace of God not because of anything we can do, not because we can run around in circles and earn God's favor by everything we do. If we miss something, if we do something wrong, if we do something right or we should have done something right by oversight or whatever, that doesn't matter. What matters in terms of your relationship with God from this point on is Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ came and settled the debt, the penalty for our sin. That Jesus Christ came and bore the punishment for our sin. He's the propitiation for our sin in order that we may be restored. Okay, so God, so so grace is a gift, and grace is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. And I just want to point out something in Isaiah, because we talked about about the Hebrew word. Isaiah chapter 30, verses, verse 19, Isaiah says that God will one day show favor, show chen, show grace to his people, delivering them from death. And that day came, that first Christmas morning, over 2,000 years ago, when Hen, grace, was born, and grace, God was incarnate, that God himself became human on our behalf. And that's what Hen is, is God becoming human. Jesus Christ is grace, and Jesus Christ is God's gift to us, even though we don't deserve it. And the third thing I want to say about grace is that grace points us to hope. Let's look at verse 6 or 8 now. We're jumping right through to verse 8. So our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 7, so that we are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is, wait for Christ's return, who will, Jesus will, sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this gift of Jesus once offered, is not a one-time thing. It is eternal. The gift of grace is eternal, and it sustains us, not in the sense of it'll make our days better, not in the sense that that God will provide us with, with money and cars and wealth and status, but he sustains us in a spiritual sense. That is, that that sacrifice that Christ made on that cross, he made once and for all. And that sacrifice sustains the church. It sustains, sustains the believers, me, you, even the messy folks at Corinth. It sustains them through to the end times. Why? So that they may be seen guiltless when Christ returns in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul and Jesus explains in Mark what happens. That's pretty much the end of things as we know it. And, uh, and, 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 and the angels will descend and the angels will collect God's people and gather God's people back to him. And so there is this sustenance now. There is this hope that no matter how weak you are, no matter, no, no, no matter how difficult your life may be, no matter how hard you may find things, that you are continually sustained by Jesus Christ. And this promise of eternal life is sustained in you by him. And we get this assurance in verse 9 when Paul says that God is faithful. And what he means by that is that through Jesus Christ, God is faithful. God keeps his promises. He says in Titus that that God cannot lie. 
God is faithfulness. God is grace. In fact, in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, uh, that's exactly, those are the, exactly the words that, that God uses to describe himself. So Moses has just cut two tablets of stone. He's up on the mountain. He wants God to show him his glory. And, uh, and so in verse 8, or verse 6, rather, of chapter 34 of Exodus, this is how God describes himself. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. There's that word, chen. Gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Now, this word steadfast is a very tricky word to translate uh, from the Hebrew. It just doesn't mean long-lasting, but it means solid and concrete and immovable. And so, when, when, when God says that his love and his faithfulness is steadfast, he means that it's, that it's immovable, that it's solid, that it's guaranteed. And so, when Paul uses the same term in verse 9 here, he's saying that God's faithfulness, God's promise through Jesus Christ is immovable, unchangeable, everlasting. And so we don't really have to spin our wheels because there's nothing we can do because of our sinful nature. There's nothing we can do to earn God's favor. But thanks be to God that he has come down incarnate in the baby Jesus and that he has bared our sin, that he, and that he bears our sins, and that he pays the penalty, and that he makes it possible, by the grace of God, he makes it possible for us to come back to him, for us to gather around him in the end days. But you'll notice also back in verse 1, that not everyone received this promise, and not everyone receives this promise grace to the church of God that is in Corinth those who are sanctified in Jesus Christ called to be saints together and to those in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ did you catch that call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ so if grace is a gift then all we have to do is receive it If grace is the person of Jesus, then all we have to do is receive him. All we have to do is call on his name. All we have to do is repent of our sins and give our lives to him. All we have to do is have faith. So folks like the church at Corinth, you know, who are clearly spinning their wheels and Paul's going to direct them and, and, and things will get better for them in terms of their behavior and their immorality. But the message for us this morning is that despite our struggles with sin, despite our failings, despite our weight, our, our intellect or our lack of intellect, despite our looks, despite our faults, despite our brokenness, despite even the disease that we fight right now in this very minute, despite all of those things, those who give their hearts to Jesus, those who confess their sins to him, who give him their messes, Christ will sustain through to the end of time. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe believe in God, God, the Father Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven and and earth. earth. I believe believe in Jesus Christ, Christ, his only Son, our our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Reconciliation with God involves admitting our need of God's mercy and forgiveness and examining our lives in His light to see what needs to be done. 
God does not patch up the parts of us that look bad. He renews and restores, giving us the joy and peace of forgiveness. Let us pray to God, our creator and sustainer. Please respond to Father of Mercy with Hear Our Prayer. Father, we give you thanks for those who have responded to your call to serve in ministry in your church. May they never lose sight of your presence, and may they respond to your will and guidance. Father, we give you thanks for those who serve you here at Good Shepherd. Guide them in their work and deliberations to do your will. Open their hearts to hear your direction and give them the courage and strength to meet the challenges that face them. We pray for the members of our parish council and for the members of our prayer team. Father of mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are unemployed or who are facing the loss of their work and income because of the economic conditions arising out of the COVID pandemic. May they receive the help and support they need to give them new hope for the future. Father of mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we give you thanks for your creation in this world in which we live. Pour out your love and mercy on this fragmented world. Draw into unity and fellowship all people and nations and let them see that in serving you, they will find perfect freedom. Father of mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for our health and for the resources you have provided to us when we are in need of physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual aid. Today we bring to you those in need. Please pray for any in need of prayer. Father, comfort them with goodness and give them patience and strength to endure their afflictions. In your time, restore them to health and enable them to lead their lives in your glory. Father of mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we give you thanks for your heavenly home to which you call us. We pray for those who have left this life to be with you. Free us from the fear of death in the knowledge that we will spend eternity in your glorious presence. Father of mercy, hear our prayer. You say it's impossible. God says all things are possible. You say I'm too tired. God says I will give you rest. You say nobody loves me. God says I love you. You say I feel alone. God says I will never leave or forsake you. It is easy to get discouraged when things are going bad. Thank you, Father, for always being at work in our lives, even in the midst of pain and suffering. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised the forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. And let's pray this together. Lamb of God, you, you take, take away, away the, the sin, sin of the world. Of the world. Have, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. And now let us pray together the prayer of spiritual communion. Dear Jesus, I love you above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people, and I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. And now, as our Savior has taught us, let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now let's say the doxology together. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Alleluia. Will 
shout your 